Here. Any of you got any gin? No. Not one of you. What about a penny for her old girl down on her luck? Ah, come on, I'm begging you. All I want is a tot of gin. I mean, it's not much to ask, is it? Who don't love gin? Mother's ruin, you say? Ha! <laughs> I imagine you want me to tell you the great and illustrious history of our nation's favourite tipple. All right, and it shall come straight from the horse's mouth, so to speak. For I was once a purveyor of the finest gin in London. Now, gin gets its name from the Dutch word for juniper, which is Genevae. For indeed it is juniper, that humble conifer, that tree of twisted trunk and gnarled bough, that sets gin apart from all other types of liquor. For juniper must be the pervading botanical and flavour for a liquor to be classed as gin. <laughs> Can't say I was too worried about that when I was still in my own stuff, to be honest. As long as it's strong and it's the spot. Now, apparently, and here's the clever bit, gin's core ingredient, juniper, as we already know, has been combined with alcohol as back as far as, ooh, 70 AD? A very clever chap, a physician, he was called, uh, oh God, what was it? Pandias Disacoria? <coughs> anyway, him. He published a five volume encyclopedia about herbal medicine, and in one of them he describes using juniper berries steeped in wine to combat chest ailments. <coughs> <coughs> Knew it. Then in 1055, the Benedictine monks in Italy included a recipe for tonic wine infused with juniper berries in their Compedium Solanita. There are references to a spirit flavoured with Genove in a 13th century Flemish manuscript. And the 16th century, or by the 16th century, the Dutch started producing a spirit that they called Genove. Basically, it was a malt wine base with a goodly amount of juniper berries, enough to mask its harsh taste and flavour. It was, of course, a medicinal liquid, just like its predecessors. Then the Dutch began producing gin in earnest with hundreds of distilleries in Amsterdam alone. Now, in the 17th century, here in England, everyone drank alcohol. Well, everyone except the Puritans, of course, but they didn't like to have any fun, did they? Now, by everyone, I mean everyone. Men, women, old crones, even young children. Folk would start the day with a glass of small beer for breakfast, and it just carried on throughout the day. Of course, it was because the water was bad, you see, full of raw sewage and disease. So everything had some alcohol in it. And there was loads of drinks to choose from and all. Cordials, punches, mixed drinks. Come on, are you sure you haven't got any gin? Ah, never mind. Now, if people drank outside the home, there were plenty of places to do so. Not just my booth on Gin Lane. <laughs> there were and still are plenty of alehouses which were run for the poor, by the poor. And there you drink beer or ale, just like the bloomin' obvious. Then there were taverns which served wine for the dentry and the obnobs in their fancy frock coats and their big wigs. And then there are inns which served wine and lots of different food as well. Oh, pork pies, beef stew, cat casserole. <laughs> then it arrived on our shores. It come with William of Orange. It arrived in the glorious revolution of 1688. And one of the most glorious things he brought with him was gin. God save the king. Long live gin and all. I mean, bless him. He began his reign by telling the French to get stuffed. <laughs> Not literally, but he brought in a trade war against them by putting in blockades and every taxes on French wine and cognac so as uh, to ruin or weaken their economy. Then he brought in an act to encourage the distilling of liquors in Britain, to hide what he was doing in France, of course. He also brought in the Corn Laws, which gave tax breaks on spirits production, mean there could be, and there was, a distilling free for all. So it was King William, God save him, who opened the door to us distillers that might like to set up. And the good thing is, this meant gin. Lots and lots of gin. The bad thing for the punters anyway was that the act didn't have any guidelines attached to it so there was no regulating of the gin or its distillers. Anyone, and I mean 
anyone could set up a distillery. And by the 1730s, there were 1,499 distillers in London, plus me, all of them producing hard liquor or gin. As I said, gin's proper name is Genevieve. The first known written use of the word gin appears in a 1714 book called The Fable of Bees by Bernard Mandeville. He said the infamous liquor, the name which derived from juniper berries and Dutch, is now by frequent use shrank into a molar symbol, intoxicating gin. <laughs> I reckon that everyone was too junk to pronounce Geneva, so they abbreviated it to gen or gin. <clears throat> anyway, do excuse me. <coughs> this law of King William's led to the gin craze. Did you know I could sell you a pint of gin for less than I would sell you a pint of beer? Oh, what, I'd go for a pint of gin now. But with it came a new set of problems and pretty much everything went downhill from there on in. Gin got in every nook and cranny of society. Here, you ever been to one of the frost fairs? No? Well, when the weather turned cold and icy, markets would be set up on the frozen rivers like the Thames and crowds of people would gather to explore the stalls and tents, most of them selling hot gin and gingerbread. Oh. Enterprising Londoners made a quick shilling or two out of the punters and they cared not how good or bad the gin was. The gin... I distilled here in London was fiendishly strong, sometimes upwards of 80% alcohol. And I would adulterate it, I don't mind telling you, I'd adulterate it with impurities. Turpentine spirit, sulfuric acid, sawdust, these are things that were commonly added. The tales of blindness, impotence and infertility amongst those who frequented the drinking dens and gin shops and the teeming London slums were not infrequent, but they never traced it back to me. <laughs> the infamous signage above the gaslit gin cellars read, drunk for a penny, dead drunk for two pennies, clean straw for nothing. The assumption was that after spending a few pennies on gin, you'd be so sozzled that your only option would be to pass out on a bed made of straw. Cheaper than the Doss house anyway. It's not just the poor that drank gin, you know. No siree. The king brought a load of Dutch sailors over from Holland and then he recruited masses of sailors here. And what do sailors do? They drink. So in essence, the king has imported a lot of people who are used to drinking and anything they can get their hands on. And sailors like to drink this stuff because it's hard drinking. It makes them look manly and butch. Gin, they say, is good for your courage, it's good for your health, it warms the cockles and so on. So you see, a bit of Dutch courage never does go amiss, now does it? And it's not just old Dutch courage neither, Gin's got her own personality, did you know that? She became known as Madame Geneve, or Jennifer as we call her in English, Geneve being the Dutch word for juniper, as you know, juniper being what goes into gin. Do you remember that bit? Anyway, she appears as this woman who will fire up sailors and soldiers who are fighting for the Protestant cause around Europe, who will be the agent of providence and prove that God has chosen Britain as its favourite nation by providing them with gin. God bless gin and God bless Madame Geneve. And all these sailing. <laughs> it's not the sailors though, gin got everywhere. As industry grew and new machines got invented and people started to flock to the cities for work in the mills and factories, while well, London, it just sucked in all these people from the countryside. Men looking to earn a few bob. Women coming to be servants and maids. Well, those girls, they're going to meet men, aren't they? Particularly sailors. And I mean, who doesn't love a sailor? <laughs> and they got sucked into the hard drinking culture as well because it was a fashionable thing to do. So fashionable that by the 1730s there were over 6,000 houses in London openly selling gin to the general public. You could get your gin at street markets, grocers, chandlers, barbers and of course brothels. In one notorious district of London, out of 2,000 houses, more than 600 were involved in the making or selling of gin. Soon the average gin consumption reached an average of over 6 gallons per person per year. You see, we poor 
got nothing else, have we? Gin takes our mind off it all, you see. We live in filth, unimaginable to the likes of you. There are whole families forced to live in single rooms within ramshackle tenements or in damp cellars with no sanitation or fresh air, see? Mouldy beds, paint peeling off the walls, damp streaming down them too. We drink water that's contaminated with raw sewage and the refuse that's left rotting in the street. Even the dead causes harm, adding to the stench and decay. Most London graveyards are overflowing and coffins are sometimes left partially uncovered in the poor holes. For us, gin is more than drink. It sates hunger pangs. It offers relief from the perpetual cold and is a blessed escape from the brutal drudgery of life in the slums and streets. It's a cheap thrill, you see. It can be had for pennies on any decrepit old street corner. The people of London, though, they began to go either totally insane or just die. Thomas Fielding, a social historian, writes about us inferior people. In 1751, his political pamphlet, Inquiry into the Causes of the Late Increase of Robbers, said, mm -mm. A new kind of drunkenness, unknown to our ancestors, is lately sprung upon us, and which, if not put a stop to, will infallibly destroy a great part of the inferior people. The drunkenness I here intend to is by this poison called gin, the principal sustenance, if it may be so called, of more than a hundred thousand people in this metropolis. As a means of getting the country's gin obsessed drunkards to tone it down a bit, a distiller's license was introduced in 1736, raising the price of a license to 50 quid, totally beyond the capacity of, well, anyone other than the big distillers who aren't interested in that kind of money. Only two official licenses were issued in the next seven years. I lost mine. I don't have that kind of money. I've been down on my luck ever since. I even held a funeral mass for Mother Jennifer, and I mourn her loss to this day. I couldn't keep going, you see, because of the informers. They're told on people. You could earn a fiver by grassing on an illegal trader. The thing is, the informers got beaten up, but the juries refused to convict those illegal gin sellers so that by 1738 they dead lettered the entire act. They just couldn't take anyone to, get it se to take it seriously. I mean... The justices wouldn't enforce it, as they were afraid it might happen. People were let off for breaking the rules and the government couldn't keep control. There were even street riots. And one of the cries that came out again and again was, No gin, no king. No gin, no king. When the Act in 1736 came around, all the ideas that had been associated with gin and the benefits of the drink come to a head. And there were loads of ballads and poems printed in praise of gin. Also, it's got so many health effects. It's so good for you because it counters the evil effects of too much tea drinking. So now you know. If you drink too much tea and you're made ill by your tea addiction, you can turn to gin to make you better. So now it's sold as a cure-all. And one of the ways in which gin sellers get round the implications of the act is to sell it as a medicine. You are drinking it for its health benefits. That's the way the middle and upper class women justify their drinking. If Queen Anne can drink it, anyone can. But then things took a strange turn in 1751. William Hogarth, an artist and satirist, did an etching called Beer Street, in which he showed all the fun and safety of beer drinking. He set this against another terrible image called Gin Lane, in which it showed the perceived depravity of gin drinkers in a gathering of all terrible stories. There's suicide, there's madness, women are so busy with their luxuries that they ignore their children. The dying man in his soldier's coat shows that we are going to lose all of our troops to gin. Then there's the woman at the front. The one dropping her baby over the side of the staircase. Some say she was inspired by Judas Defoe, a silk thread spinner from Spitalfields. Defoe was supposedly driven so utterly mad by her gin addiction that in 1734 she took her two-year-old daughter Mary to a field with a friend named Suki. The two women removed all of the toddler's clothes and abandoned her in a ditch. The pair then proceeded to sell the clothing for money to purchase a quartern of gin. 
Poor Mary died, no doubt of exposure, cold and starvation, and her mother, once she was caught, was promptly sentenced to death by hanging. Then there's all the other things in there, isn't there? There's the pawn shop and the old uh, coffin-shaped sign above the shop there. There's people begging, gnawing at bones, doing anything they can to survive. There's a man beating himself over the head with some bellows while toting a baby impaled on a spike. There's a suicidal barber and lots and lots of syphilitic sores, amongst other charming things. Gin Lane vilified gin and they blamed it for the death of thousands of people by overindulgence, murder, negligence and insanity. This brought about more measures to outlaw its production and consumption, but to little avail. The print was accompanied by a verse from James Townley. Gin, cursed fiend, with fury fraught, makes human race a prey. It enters by a deadly draught and steals our lives away. Now, in 1751, the Gin Act was passed. The idea was to crack down on spirits consumption. With raised taxes and fees for retailers, licenses became even harder to come by. In addition to beer, the consumption of tea was promoted. I remember a moment ago, I just said how bad tea was for you, but suddenly it's good for you because it requires freshly boiled water, can be drunk by the masses from the richest estates to the poorest dwellings. The growth of our cities, they say, can be put down pure and simple to tea. The bad water and the gin, they say, caused illness, disease, even death. But tea, with its freshly boiled water and natural goodness, allows the working classes to live cheek by jowl with our arm. There are those, of course, who say that the poor shouldn't drink tea at all, but I reckon those people are more concerned with their profits than they are with the health of the working classes. Here. I think I might have just thought of a new niche. Maybe I could become a tea seller. Oh, there must be loads of ways to adulterate that. Getting the dried leaves out the back of them posh houses by the maids. And of course there's colourings, isn't there? Copper, copper carbonate. That'll make it greener and lead sulphate. It'll make it blacker, won't it? I bet we could mix some sort of dung into it as well to make it really go far. <laughs> you see, the gin act has all but wiped out the little sellers like me the chandler's shops, the market ladies and so on. To sell gin, you have to have a licensed premises now, <laughs> such as alehouses, taverns or inns. Licensed premises. I ain't even got a roof over me head. There's just nowhere to get any. Oh, come on. Come on, surely you've got some spare. There must be some around it. <laughs> Look what I've got. <laughs> Don't bother. I've got my own, I have. Oh, if I could get the lid off it, that would be a grand thing, wouldn't it? I've saved this for such an occasion as this. Well, to gin. Bottoms up, my lovelies.